Take your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Romans. I'm sure Brother Phil and Jeremiah have, have found this out, that sometime another preacher will be preaching, and, and one of the verses in the message they preach touches your heart, and you, your mind starts working. And, and a, a verse that Brother Phil used the other night, Romans 1.1, 1, 1. I want to stay uh, there for a little bit tonight and, and uh, talk about it. And, and the verse talks about being separated unto the gospel. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, when someone is separated unto something, there's a natural inference that I get from the verse that they're, they're coming from something else unto whatever it says you're to be separated unto. It's just like uh, the Bible says, repentance toward God. Well, that means you've, you've changed your mind, you've changed your direction, you've changed your heart from one thing, and it's turning uh, to God. If that makes sense to you. Uh, there's a verse that says, uh, speaking to the Jews, repent and believe the gospel. Well, he's encouraging them to re repent of their unbelief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They need to repent and believe the gospel. So here we have a verse where Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, and it says he's separated unto the gospel of God. Now, if you're separated unto something, the obvious inference, in order to be separated unto something, you have to be also separated from something before that. And uh, I think a lot of times we as Christians are, are guilty of wanting people to live up to our standards. I think it's human, human nature where we expect other people to live up to our standards. And we obviously assume that if, our stand, if they live up to our standards, surely they're going to be okay with God. Maybe, maybe not. But we're, we're great on demanding that, that you need to live like I live. You need to be as separated as I am. I, I heard a, a preacher preach one night, and I, it makes sense to me that uh, the definition of a legalist is anyone who has one more conviction than you do. They're a legalist. Once they've, they've passed that threshold to go one conviction beyond where you are, then they've gone to the extreme, man. They're, they're way out of bounds with that. So we find as a church and as Bible believers, we're still a very imperfect. We're imperfect as humans. But here it says to be separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if we know, and we do from Titus 3.50, that not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost. If we know that, then we know why, what is the reason for us to be separated unto the gospel. Well, we're separated into the gospel that we might be an effective witness for the gospel. If, if we're living an obvious unholy life and the world sees in us nothing separate than the world system they're in, then we've lost our effectiveness. We're not separated into the gospel. We're a detriment to the gospel. We're a stumbling block to the gospel. We're a hindrance to the gospel. So, therefore... We should try to live holy. The Lord said, be ye holy, for I am holy. We should do our best to eliminate anything in our lives that would be a stumbling block to the gospel. If I'm separated into the gospel, you know what should come first? The gospel. The gospel should come first. The cause of Christ should come first. Separated into the gospel, where does the power come from? I'm not, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel 
for it is the power of God unto salvation. So there's power in the gospel. So if we're going to be separated unto the gospel, we need to, maybe those things that we're pretty much okay with, maybe not everybody else is. The things that are okay with me might not be okay with that person that I deal with on the street. Your testimony precedes you. Your testimony and your reputation can affect very much your witness for the cause of Christ. Uh, Romans 1.9. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. Do you see that? Paul said, I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. So notice the fact that he said, I serve in the spirit. Or you remember reading someplace where the Bible said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's a spiritual warfare. Our worship needs to be spiritual. Our walk needs to be spiritual and not carnal. That yielding to the Spirit, there it comes again, all through uh, the gospel message, all through the, the, the training uh, that Paul gives uh, the, the churches is this thing of yielding and submitting to God. Walk in the light as he is in the light. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. God is a spirit, that's John 4, 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how does this separation come about? I'm separated into the gospel of God. How does that separation occur? Well, if you remember Adam and Eve, when they sinned, God was done with them as far as fellowship. God withdrew his spirit from them. I'm talking about intimate spiritual fellowship. God withdrew, had to withdraw his spirit because of sin. So then we look at the new birth. What happens at the new birth? At the new birth, your soul and spirit are separated from the body of flesh. It appears that the only way that God can have fellowship with us is to figure out a way to cut loose that sinful part of man and let every man who chooses Jesus Christ become a new creature. Because of what Christ did, we're able to do that. Now, what do you tell the Jew? He gave the Jew the sign of, of circumcision, it's called. And there's a token between the Jew and God. What did that represent? Uh, in, in my feeble mind, it represented the new birth. It had to do with putting off the flesh. And it pictured the new birth. It had to do with the seed of all things. So you look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. And you'll see how, how man, God enables man to be to where God can fellowship with him. The Lord told Nicodemus, you must be born again. There's nothing about that sinful flesh that God can hang out with. Colossians 2.10, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, watch it, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. See, it's spiritual here. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Remember the Lord, he shows up down there at the, the Jordan River, uh, John had told that crowd, there come a, uh, I indeed baptize you with water, but there comes someone after me. There's one that cometh after me 
whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Is that talking about water? No, it's not. It's talking about spirit baptism. Here it is. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. You're identified with, with his crucifixion, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all forgiven you all trespasses. Brother uh, uh, Phil explains that quite eloquently about that, the, that Holy Spirit of God then intertwines, interwoven, I forget exactly how he states that, with your spirit. And you become a new creature in Christ. Your life then, that life of that new creature is then hid with Christ in God. God sees the righteousness of his son. Jesus Christ became the end of the law for righteousness. Didn't do away with the law. The law is pure. The law is holy. He didn't, he, he didn't do away with it. He fulfilled it. But, but we no longer get our righteousness from the law. Our righteousness is in Christ. He, we put on his righteousness. We are made the righteousness of God in him. Buried with him in baptism where and also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together, made alive. Again, that which was dead. You were dead in trespass and sin. You trusted Jesus Christ. You were born again into the family of God. Quickened, made alive again together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. I'm not under the law. I'm under the grace. Nothing wrong with the law. But my righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. Law was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way. Nailing it to his cross. This sinful body of flesh is nailed to the cross with Christ. Isn't that what Paul said? Galatians 2.20 said, I am crucified with Christ. <laughs> Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 1.13, in whom, also, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit, there's that spirit thing again, of promise. New creatures in Christ. So if, if all that's true, and it is, then why should I, why should we encourage, why should we preach righteousness, living righteous, living holy, living a separated life for the gospel's sake? We're separated unto the gospel. Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Mm. Matthew 10, 37, we'll see that. Well, for separated into the gospel, all through Scripture, God says that he needs... He demands the preeminence. Does God have the preeminence in our walk? Or is God way down the list? Is it this, 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 that, and then maybe God? God is not really a back burner God. Now, he says something that sounds pretty cruel and, and, and it's hard. I'm mean, the first time I read it, Ben. I don't know if I get that or not. Uh, over in, let me, let me find it. Matthew 10, 37. 
He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Man, that's hard to take. But God said it, and I believe it, and God demands that I love him more than everything else. That's not easy. <clears throat> in my years as, as a policeman, years as a pastor, years in the addiction ministry, I've run into a lot of folks who, who you just absolutely turn off if you tell them that God needs to be number one in their life. I've run into a, a, a lot of ladies who w would not dare let their husband have preeminence over their children. You know a lot of folks like that too. My children comes first. I will never let a man interfere with my relationship. Well, with that attitude of marriage is pretty much doomed to failure if that's the attitude. God has an order. You can like it or you can love it, but God has an order. God first. Your husband, your children. God has an order. And, and most of the time when we get in trouble uh, uh, in, in the church with our preaching, when people will huff up and soul up over hard preaching is because they don't like God's order. They disagree with God's order. Every, Matthew 19, 29, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Man, that's wild. Mark 8, 35, Lord said, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, there it is, lose his life for the gospel's sake. You put your life, you subordinate your life to the gospels. Gospel comes first. Can, can, can we buy into that? It's what God said. Believing it and doing it are two different animals. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. There's a term for those things. I forget how many of them there are in Scripture. He that is first shall be last. All those and here who he will he who loses his life will save it. There's a, a, a contradiction in terms, and there's a, a, a phrase, a term for that, and I forgot what it is. Mark 10, 29, and Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Can you do that? Man, God's asking a lot. Sure he is. He, he paid an awful price just to keep me and to keep you out of hell. Matthew, it says it again in Matthew 10, 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Luke 4, 18. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive. Hey, he delivered me. If you let him, he'll deliver you from all those chains that are keeping you, holding you back from being separated unto the gospel. Cody Jones here was saying, he broke the chains of fear and sorrow. He'll break those chains. It's a hard thought to be separated unto the gospel of God. Deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind to sit at liberty, them that are bruised. 
Paul, and I love this verse. This verse just showed up kind of out of nowhere. But it has an interesting doctrinal connotation. Romans 2, 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You remember what Paul's gospel was? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. That's why I don't go running throughout the Old Testament and throughout a whole bunch of other things to try to find my salvation because it says here, and I believe the Bible, that I'm going to be judged by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what Paul said. Whether I believe it or whether I don't believe it, whether I've embraced it. Galatians... Uh, no, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. The Old Testament folks, they didn't know about the church. They didn't have a clue about the church. You'll see that up to a point in the New, New Testament where Jesus Christ is preaching to the Jews, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you'll read that all through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John shows up. And, and uh, earlier the Lord told that, that, that fellow who asked how he might inherit eternal life, the Lord said, you know the commandments, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt, you know, keeping the commandments. But when John shows up and writes his account, Something had changed. Well, what had changed? John wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. What changed? This mystery had been revealed. The mystery of the church. John knew about the church. John was written about 90 A.D., and the church was revealed to Paul around 60, 62 A.D., somewhere in there. So that's the difference. That's why John is very much different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They didn't know about the church. And the Lord told them things that the crucifixion they didn't have a clue about. They didn't understand the fact that how he was going to raise, rise from the dead and all. They didn't, they didn't quite get it. A lot of prophecies about it. You remember uh, the, the man on the Emmaus Road, how the, he opened the scriptures to them? Paul said this in Galatians 1.11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Paul didn't get it from, from man. It wasn't in the, the church bylaws or constitution at the, down at the synagogue. Galatians 2, 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Here we get mixing in religion, Judaism, and Christianity. But we see here that God still wants Christians to live in holiness for the gospel's sake. We don't want people to turn off the message and reject the message because of the messenger. And that's what happened. What uh, Paul said, he said, uh, lest when I have preached to others, he said, I keep under my body. Is that the right context? And bring it into subjection, duh, Lest when I have preached to others, I would be I might be considered a castaway. I myself be a castaway. He's not talking about losing his salvation. He's talking about losing his testimony, his witness, his ministry. If we're purporting ourselves to be Christians, then we don't want to live like the rest of the world. Well, there needs to be something that, that says about my life, about your life, that we're separated unto the gospel, that the gospel is more important than my taste in music, my taste in entertainment, my taste in this, taste in that. Is it? 
separated unto the gospel. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. You know, it's that word of his faith. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about being separated unto the gospel, living a holy, righteous, clean, separated life that we might be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, that we might be like him. Isn't that what the Bible says? For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. We might not like that confirmation. What the verse said, I, I shall awake and be satisfied. I shall be satisfied with his likeness. Are we? Would we? Would you be satisfied with the likeness of Jesus Christ? Man, I don't know. He's pretty old-fashioned. Hmm. Ephesians 6, 15, and your feet shod with a preparation of the gospel of peace. How are you going to be effective witness if, you're, if you haven't prepared yourself in holiness, in separation, in clean living, have your Bible reading in place, have your prayer life in place? That's preparation. And you do it, why? With a preparation of the gospel of peace. What was a book by uh, John Getz? And who's the other guy with him out there in California? Paul Chapel. The book about, I forget the title of the book, but, but he's talking about a, a, someone preaching the gospel. If you, take, if you take eight hours in preparation, in mental and preparation, getting your scriptures down and the, the, and, and the knowledge that you have. You take eight hours putting all that together. He said you need to take at least an equal amount of time in preparing your heart to give the message. Or else you just become a documentary. It needs to be from the heart. Folks know when you're <coughs> preaching from the heart. <coughs> Way back in the day, I was a juvenile probation officer, a probation officer for the circuit court. And I found that those kids, they could read you like a book. They knew whether you were for real or whether you were doing a job. They, they could read you like a book, whether you were just a professional probation officer or you had a heart. I wanted to see those kids succeed. And my biggest goal for those kids was to see them, see them get saved. A lot of them, there was no such thing as a normal childhood for a lot of those kids after what they've gone through in their homes. I'd also dealt with that as a court-appointed special advocate for kids who were, had been screwed up by life, by craziness. Boy, if you can only get if I can only get them saved, get them uh, the knowledge of Christ, let them trust Jesus Christ, then they would become survivors. But they could read you like a book. I used to tell young caseworkers would come in from family services, and I would say, if now if you were taught in college with a social worker degree, if you were taught to never allow yourself to get personally involved, and that's what they many times teach, never allow yourself to get personally involved, I said, you may spend your entire career without ever making a difference in anyone's life. That's my opinion. Same in the ministry. If you never allow yourself, never allow your heart to break, your heart to be burdened, or tears to fall, 
for someone in your congregation, somebody that you see is lost and going to hell, and you never get uh, upset about it, it never uh, touches your heart, you're in the wrong business. You're in the wrong spot. You've got to let it all touch your heart. You bear the burdens. Give it to God and let him bear your burdens with you. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Does your conversation, your walk, uh, the way you're known in the community, does it reflect flattery upon the gospel of Christ? If it becometh the gospel of Christ, I mean, it looks good. It's a good thing for the gospel. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit. There's that spirit again. With one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We want to see people get saved. We want, the, we want everyone. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now some folks will get sidelined on some Calvinistic uh, uh, clap trap uh, where they think, well, it's all cut and dried anyway. That fellow wouldn't witness to a house cat because he thinks it's already determined, predetermined that, 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 that God has, has predetermined that so many million babies are going to go to hell. No, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Whosoever will, let him come. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. All things are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. You've got to watch how you act around other people if you want to ever witness to that person. Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended, or is made weak. Isn't that what John the Baptist was about? He came neither eating meat nor drinking wine. You know why? He didn't want it to have anything in his ministry that would be a stumbling block to the message. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But if a man said to you, this is offered and sacrificed to idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He said, conscience, I say, not thine own. Boy, this is a hard doctrine for a lot of folks. Not your own conscience, but of the other. Why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? That's where you get into your, your convictions versus someone else's. If you're doing something that someone else thinks is wrong, that someone else thinks is sinful, you're not being very kind to that person by doing it. Doing it in his face, you become a stumbling block to the gospel to that fella or that lady or that child. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? For that which I give thanks. Then he says, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That kind of, puts you, that kind of puts you in a special category. You're not there for yourself. You're allowing yourself to be judged by another's conscience uh, in the sight of God, under the word of God, that you might win the loss. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Let us therefore, Romans 14, 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. My, my, my. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Well, a lot of times we'll stand up for our rights in the church. Well, I can wear what I want to the church. Yeah, sure you can. I don't care if you show up in a Batman costume. But you can sure be a stumbling block to someone else who, with a weak conscience who don't have the liberty that you have. Oh, but you can, oh, I'm going to assert my liberty. Go ahead. 
that he no longer should live the rest of his time, 1 Peter 4, 2, in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in the lasciviousness. List a bunch of things here which you at one time were into. It says, of such were some of you, it says. Lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it is strange, think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge? Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Mark 12, 30, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. None other commandment greater than these. Why do you do that? Because you're separ- you should be separated unto the gospel. You do it all for the gospel's sake. You say, well, I'm under the grace. I don't have to do that. I, did. I don't have to live like I don't, I'm not under the law. Well, you take that stance. But God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Paul said, I want you to be separated into the gospel. The gospel takes precedence over your liberty and over your personal things that, you, that, that you, you think God's given you grace about and you're okay with it at home. Then do it at home. Don't do it out in front of folks. Separated unto the gospel of God. I'm done. Piano player, come.